which is about two jobs ago now. Uh, I want to do upgrade the thing. I want to talk about modular architecture. I need to upgrade the things to put more than them. Uh, create pieces of data put together and put a lot of other would be uh, grateful. The thing is, what is very common is what happens to every single person on the idea. So I broke down to uh, smaller pieces of good deal. Uh, I ended up thinking about classes and components because that was uh, trivial for me. Um, the truth is, at one time or another, trying to define what I was trying to talk about. Um, so, again, components and modifiers, so it's not very catchy. Um, and then, components and modifiers, low rifles, meaning that, like, the core thing I want to talk about. Uh, and then, like, uh, the same component file, which I deal with, which I think identifies how we feel with the component and the actual So, again, my name is Martin Schiller. I'm not telling you the Commonwealth International. Uh, if you haven't heard of the Commonwealth International, it's published for Gold, GQ, Wire, uh, and many other. Uh, if you want to talk about fashion, uh, let's not do that. Uh, anyway, I've been in the industry for a long time now, and I was a one master way before it was cool. Um, anyway, this is for components, buttons, and shapes that I deal with. And I'm very proud about this subtitle. Uh, how I came up with a good use of quotes from Lost in Translation. <laughs> <laughs> Who saw the movie Lost in Translation? Okay, quite a few. Actually. How do you feel about the movie? Quite confused. Thank you. So this is, <laughs> this is the thing. Uh, Lost in Translation is a movie that leaves you with uh, a lot of unanswered questions, uh, if you want. And for, for the people that didn't see the movie, it's the story of a uh, seasoned uh, actor, uh, Bill Murray, uh, and a uh, young woman, uh, Scarlett Johnson, they meet in Japan, uh, where he's shooting a commercial, and she is uh, going on a trip with uh, her uh, fiance, boyfriend, something like that, uh, who is a photographer, fashion photographer. And so she is in the town the whole day without anyone to talk with, uh, everyone speaks Japanese but them. Um, they start this weird, not romantic relationship and they leave each other's score. Uh, and he helps her to figure out that, well, not to figure out that, that's fine. Uh, he helps her processing uh, what she wants to be and she helps him processing his really tragic, pretty much. Um, again, it is not so it's just a process. Uh, the thing is, I told you about the same, right? I'm going to go through a few examples of what. Uh, Problems around the moment uh, and other architectures. And I'm not going to give you any answer to me. There isn't a solution for it. It's just a lot of questions that I know will sparkle. Kudia's been you in looking at your ways, your way of being uh, components and patterns and that stuff. Um, on top of that, uh, Alan Bob, a few years ago, uh, gave a fantastic talk about um, design systems. And she said that meaning is complex and looking at lost in translation, everybody has their own mental model of things, which is probably the worst problem we have to deal with when we talk about uh, modern architectures. Um, because the thing is, she was talking about modular design, but it does apply quite well to development as well. Um, and I need to go a little bit into sort of that. Um, so between 2014 and 2015, uh, I used to work at Shizan. Uh, she's not with the music app, as you might know, uh, and they do have a website, yes, and no one knows about that. And the website like that was uh, a very non-modern stack. Uh, it, it was a uh, moustache, uh, we had a very small uh, JavaScript footprint uh, with a framework we wrote, and we used BAM to define our model. Um, we used uh, the atomic design uh, approach, work with it. Okay, a few. Uh, so, uh, in 2013, so when pretty much when I started working, well, a year ago, so I was working with uh, released an article where he wrote about how to break down your designs in smaller components. And she theorized, oh, sorry, he theorized this um, breakdown. Starting from the pages, you can identify templates, which are parts of the page, and you can replicate across different pages. And then you can break it down to organisms, and in smaller pieces, molecules, and 
in smaller area patterns. So an atom would be probably a button, for example. Uh, a molecule could be uh, a form. Uh, an organism could be a letter, a page, and, and on and on. So this was 2013. So we were like this was the algorithm probably defined for most of the different people what a model architecture could be. Um, the thing is, for us as well, it went back a little bit. Um, in 2011, uh, was it was announced that the browser vendors and the good PC were starting thinking about web components. Seven years later, we can tell that they kind of failed to deliver because we haven't had everything uh, delivered yet. Some things have delivered. But anyway, this, is, this was the dream for us. We, we've been striving to get this thing as developers for a long time. Isolated um, execution, isolated scope for CSS and everything else, and proper modular web. Um, but if we go even back, uh, in terms of modernization and our appetite for it, uh, Anna Dabinam, uh, she has a fantastic talk about public libraries, and she said that her first, her first experience hearing about public libraries uh, was from a designer that we done uh, in a project that goes back to 2009, which is ages in uh, web time. Um, at this point, though, <coughs> I need to be a guest to talk about other libraries. And as I mentioned before, Anna has a talk on it, and probably it will take the whole time to uh, talk about pattern libraries. So I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to say is that for the purpose of my talk, a pattern library is a dictionary of visual elements that compose your apps or website. <coughs> uh, so let's just keep it simple like that. You might have different uh, ways of referring to it. It could be design system, it could be Again, about the library, uh, whatever. Like for me, it's a visual dictionary. It could be in code or in sketch or in any other software. But a visual dictionary of how your box composing, composing your app look like. So again, 2009 was. I, I went back and tried to, to build the timeline for this. This is the first reference I've seen uh, of um, some modular attitude towards web. Well, the thing is, we didn't quite get it as developers until 2013. So React, when React came out, it was a revolution in itself. Like it's, I'm not a fanboy. Let's start with that. Like I'm not one of those React fanboys. Uh, but React did pretty really change the game for most of us and for most of the big libraries out there. Like Angular, after that, started introducing uh, directives and started kind of copying the approach. Uh, Vue is in, has improved on the base of what React before. Um, so it, it's a journey that started effectively with React for us as developers. Um, but where are we at today? Like what, what's, why am I here talking about this? So as I said before, I was trying to frame the issue that we had and Allah again in 2015 said uh, we actually tend to apply a modern approach to your day-to-day -day work. It isn't really that simple. And it really isn't. So my like my feeling when I try to use components and reuse and build them is this. Have you ever felt like that as developers? I try to fit a square and a circle and I'm um, it. So I, I found that my problem with it is that most of the time I end up trying to um, work around the pattern I created to make them work in my day to day activity. Um, so I was trying to think about the question that came up with this. How do we really use our patterns in a slide with different use cases? Um, which again is, is a problem I've been experiencing for quite a while. Um, and yeah, it's kind of hard, but um, so this is not about any specific technology. Uh, again, all of my examples are probably gonna be uh, SAS and React, but that's for convenience, it could be applied to anything. Um, is about maintainability, is about uh, responsibilities of the models and the components, and about the graph itself. Um, so, the, the, the very first um, big, big smell I found uh, in a code base, well, I think it's a smell, it uh, is, is what they call class name injection, and you might have seen this. So, we had a pattern library with a lot of buttons that were defined and nice and blah blah, and then uh, at some point, we found this piece of code uh, in, in the code base in the company we were working uh, in. 
So my, my, my problem with it is this. Um, injecting a class in, in a component that is defined and has a very specific visual appearance means that you can basically override anything. Um, specifically, the code, the CSS code for it was this one. Um, so it was called, well, you can see the part that it says that is in the content action CSS. So it's far away from the button CSS. And it does have some rules that if you don't know how the button is being coded, you wouldn't know what it is. So for example, like, how does this padding line item flex affect the base button? Uh, it turns out the flex wasn't even used, so it was really fine instead. But the point is, like, opening this file on production as CSS for me is, is I, I could change anything and break anything. Uh, and on top of that, like, these colors are not the button colors. Why are we writing the colors? I guess the design is not. I, I, would, I would wonder, like, why are we making this assumption? Um, so, like, injecting a class name is really flexible. You can do whatever with it. Uh, and that works pretty well if you have to make changes and create exceptions. But it doesn't really scale, it doesn't really work in terms of maintenance uh, because you could change the original pattern and break everything in remote areas of your app and not even noticing it unless you have some visual regression. Um, but again, this was one thing that I've seen quite a while ago presented in a conference talk as well as a good practice. And it was like, wow. Um, do anyone use custom injection in their code base? Have you ever tried this approach? Have you seen it? Okay. <laughs> Are you still doing it? Okay, that's good. That's good. Nice. Uh, okay, so then I moved on. And uh, when we have the new code coming in, um, we have to think about how to make an assumption. So we're talking about the models here. Like we have this, we have this well-defined model. This is not mine, of course, it's from an article I found on the internet. Uh, I'm going to give the links to the presentation later on. Um, so we have our model, we have our mock and blah, blah. And this was perfect for our plot side, but then all of a sudden we needed a different uh, model. And the form was weird, you know, such a big uh, screen, so we needed another one. Uh, not to mention that the model uh, could have been different from mobile because one was mimicking the full size page, the other one was supposed to be a model. So what we uh, decided to do instead of uh, uh, in, well, we still injected the class name, but we injected the class name that made sense with the dialog instead of being within the context of the power component. So we have a dialog that is a registered user, uh, with a registered user modified. So this dialog only finds a different way, basically, and that's it. And it does leave the dialog CSS. So when you look through the dialog CSS, that's amazing, because you have all the exceptions there, and it's all together. And you know what changes apply to the uh, original definition. The thing is, you could have dozens of them, and they're very specific to the usage, right? If you have the same result, you just use the wizard and whatever. Um, so, all you know, this practice is, does allow for a certain amount of flexibility. It keeps everything in the same context, so it's easy to go through and make changes, making sure that you have everything under control. On the other hand, though, you might have a bloated file size, because in pages that doesn't really require for all the models, you get all of them. And it doesn't quite scale, you can define specific instances of every single model uh, or buttons or whatever. Um, but it did work for us, we had a few, not many, so it kind of made sense. Um, another approach to this is a specialized patterns of what are modifiers made for in, in BAT. So instead of having a registry user we have a prompt uh, model, which is based again, it could be a registry, it could be a login, it could be whatever as a prompt. And then you have the start from prompt. It looks pretty much exactly as the previous one, with the main difference that the semantic is completely different. It's not anymore an ad hoc solution, it's a generic pattern. So we are specializing the pattern for a specific use case. Um, again, perfect. Like this, it, it works. There are no special cases, but pretty fine flavors, so it's amazing. The two drawbacks are that it's flexible on the client stand, but also it does push a little bit. <coughs> to do preemptive abstraction because you start creating all these fantastic uh, components that you might use once. Uh, again, is it a solution? I don't know. In a reality world, we probably wouldn't at this point introduce classing anymore. We would expose a different API to uh, create this specific type of 
component. Uh, I'm sure the other languages have the same approach to it. Uh, so again, like these three scenarios, the three things I've seen uh, in the databases of work with, uh, they go from the uh, more liberal to the more strict ones. Um, and they go to this point and say, like, okay, I'm completely stuck. I don't know what I'm talking about. Do you feel the same? Okay. So you feel that I don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> anyway. So I, I, I was stuck. I was completely stuck. And because it's not that simple. It's not. Um, so I went back. And I decided to reframe the issue. So the problem to me at this point, after going through this exercise, was not anymore how do we use the components, but why. So I start thinking on why did we need that exception, what happened that made us create this new component, uh, etc. And I figured that we have I found three use cases that are the most obvious for us. Uh, one of them is arranging the children component within the parent component, so spacing within uh, the container. Um, a solution for that could be, and again, I'm just proposing different scenarios here, but one solution could be to give the, the parent component the responsibility to deal with that specific spacing uh, concern. So the dialogue is not specific in any way, uh, you wrap it with a Container that says this is the game intent dialog. Uh, the game intent dialog lives in the game intent CSS while the dialog is flexible to adapt to whatever container it's given to, and uh, everyone is happy. So, the practice, this practice defines responsibility in a neat way. Every parent and children component have their own responsibility in terms of code, in terms of knowing what context they're based in, etc. There is no way to you might get a lot of this uh, around components. So your HTML could be really built in diabetes, as they call it. Um, another approach, uh, sorry, another problem uh, I was then saw was having space in relation with other components. So not necessarily within the part component, but between one component and the other. And I, find, I found a reasonably adequate solution for this, which is using um, specific classes to define spacing. Again, this might look huggy as is, but the cool thing it does is that it moves back the conversation of the spaces between components in the design process. So you could end up defining all the spaces and all the relationships between different components and codify them. I used to ask things, you could use uh, SAS variables and that's a very elegant way of dealing with all the spaces in your app without having to ask any at any time, again, how many pixels are from the title and the uh, subtitle, for example. Um, again, a few classes, uh, sorry, the, 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 way you're, the, the risk is that you can get a state situation if you don't keep up with it. Um, and the flexibility of these things could be not enough for certain designs, that's true. Um, but again, I find these really good. Um, Another way of dealing with it, which I find again quite elegant, even though maybe not for every component, is to use open components. And by open components, I mean that uh, instead of overwriting the icon, for example, in uh, the context of a quest and content block, like we did here, uh, we could uh, the icon to expose uh, a mix sensitive SAS, for example, in this case. Uh, that takes a size, and you could use that mix in across your code base. Um, this way, the icon code is always living within the icon CSS, and you always know what you expose, and you never end up overriding things that you don't know how they will react. Um, again, um, again, every icon would probably go for something like this, maybe more um, approachable. Uh, but again, it depends on how you use it. Um, so again, every base component can be flexible. Uh, it's defined by the developers, and of course by the designers if they want uh, the components to be flexible. Uh, the developers always have control of what they expose. There are problems as well, nothing is perfect. So this could mean 
introduce a lot of complexity for developers to deal with these things. It's literally a zero result. It could end up having dozens of properties and dozens of changes de facto, uh, making it valid the API itself by a model architecture. Uh, and again, that needs some thoughts to think how a local component fits in a codified language, in a codified visual, visual language. As I was going through with it, I was thinking, that doesn't get easier. Uh, and the, if the audio doesn't fail me, uh, I tried before, it's very, very quiet, so bear with me. Uh, I want to show you a clip from last presentation about that. You did it up as much as. Does it get easier? No. Yes. I guess it is. Oh, yeah? Thanks. <laughs> the more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. The more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. Um, and again, let's, let's remember what she said. I just don't know what I'm supposed to be. Uh, this movie is a revelation for me when I think about my architectures. I feel like fun uh, So the, the common language is a, a common language is a first step toward communication across cultural boundaries. This is exactly what the previous soul was talking about, like giving people uh, a way of talking to each other and even enforcing them with a dictionary that makes sense to them uh, enables understanding and able to mean to be spurious. Um, so the real problem to me is not the more of the code, like the code is a consequence of how we converse with people. Uh, the problem is how to understand and convey the meaning of perception in our topics, how do we understand why design makes change, how we communicate back to find change that in our mental model doesn't quite apply to the other memory and to, to get a feedback on why that happens. So I think the problem goes back uh, to before we start coding at all. And they realized that because they started from the end result and the build up. Uh, and so, like, again, learning what button we are building is supposed to be, what we represent in our system, is way more important than coding it. Um, and as getting involved early, but again, as a previous one said, I think people from different uh, uh, backgrounds and different capacity in the team is really important. And as developers, we try to forget that as soon as we can, but talking to people is really, really fundamental of our job. 